Good morning, everybody. I've got a message for you today that will really be very, very important. The title, if you want a title for this, is we have a new program, How We Will Win the World for Christ. And it's something that's very, very important for all of us to pay attention to today. Um, I want to show you what you can do for Christ. We may be right in the last days. What I mean by that is the Jews have already told, and I've already mentioned this before, how that they have five red heifers in Israel. And they believe that by next year, uh, by they believe that, let's turn off our phones. They believe that by next year, uh, at least one of those red heifers are going to be ready for sacrifice. Now, once that occurs, once they find out that one of those red heifers are ready for sacrifice, they will start the daily sacrifice. Why is that significant? Daniel 9 talks about the daily sacrifice. It will be started three and a half years before the world's greatest tribulation known to man in history. So folks, we're looking at next year. They may start offering up the daily sacrifice. If that be the case, what can you and I do to prepare for that time? We need to really pay attention to today's message. And if you know anybody who's not here today, you tell them, hey, you missed a message. Get on YouTube or Facebook, whatever, and, and, and listen to that message because it's that important that they hear this message today. Now, one person can do so much. I'm going to turn to Acts chapter 9 and show you. You see, here's the problem. The devil says you can't do anything. You're just one person. And that being the case, well, then why even bother trying if you are just one person and you can't do anything? I remember back uh, in 1962, a, a woman who was an atheist became very, very famous because she didn't want her son having to sit in, in public school and have them pray and that type of thing. Up until 1962, kids were praying in school. They were pledging the allegiance. I remember that. And then she made it illegal for people to pray in all 50 states. One woman took it to the Supreme Court and won. And you say, well, Keith, I'm only one person. What can I do? She up, up, turned upside down the whole United States of America from 1962 on. I mean, we had all the problems of riots and this type of thing in the 60s. The 70s, you know, we had the, 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 the sexual revolution in the 60s and 70s. I mean, we, and now we've got corruption in the government, and it's just horrible. And all this really started, you can pinpoint it to 1962, when America officially threw God out of its consciousness. In Daniel 9, and I'm sorry, Daniel, i got Daniel in my mind. Acts chapter 9 and verse 15, the Lord said, go your way, he, Paul, at that time his name was only Saul. He later nicknamed himself Paul for the sake of the Greeks. He is a chosen vessel to me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. One man could do that. And I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Verse 20, and what did Paul do? Straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues. He didn't say, well, I'm just one person. I can't do anything. Paul went out and did all these great things. Now in chapter 17, one man went out and went to all these countries. Chapter 17 and verse 2. As Paul, as his manner was, went into them three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them out of the synagogues. Could you do something like that? Verse 3, and he was opening and alleging that the Christ, as the Greek says, the Christ must needs have suffered and so on. And so he was preaching the gospel to them. So they went out looking for, for Paul and Silas. They were going to arrest him. They couldn't find him. They went to Jason's house. And verse 6, and when they found them not, they drew Jason out and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city. And here's what they said about Paul and Silas. These who have turned the world upside down are come here also. And you say, well, I can't do anything. I'm just one person. Paul went out and turned the world upside down. That's how they looked at it. We can do a lot. Let me ask you this. Think about this. Have you ever considered what if one person determined to win one person to Christ and or the truth of God, and he did that every six months, but dedicated. I, I'm, you know, you don't, don't say, well, I'm not an ordained minister, bishop, evangelist, or what have you. No, just make up your decision. I am going to do that every six months. And then he taught his converts to do the same thing. You could do that. 
And you can teach your folks, I want you to go out and win one person every six months to Christ. What would happen if a person did that and everyone under him kept doing that? So in other words, you, you're the only Christian in the world, just you. And you win one, it takes you six months to get one person to come to Christ. Now there are two of you. And the two of you in the next six months go win one person. Now there are four Christians at the end of one year. In the next six months, if you do that, you keep doing this, there'll be eight Christians in the world, if there's only you to start with. And by the end of two years, you now have 16 Christians. And then in six months, you have 32. And you keep doing this every six months. So at the end of the third year, you have 64 people. In the next six months, you have 128. By the end of the fourth year, you have 256. Doesn't sound like much, and you're trying to win the world to Christ. Jesus said, go into all the world, go into all nations and preach the gospel. And at the end of four years, after all that work, you've got 256 people. But if you keep doing that, at the end of five years, you've reached 1,000, 1,024. But then in the next six months, you double that. Now you've got 2,000. It's like taking that penny, and you keep doubling it every day for a month. At the end of your first um, a week is something like 60-some cents, but at the end of the month, look how much money you've got. You take a penny and just double it every day for 30 days. At the end of six years, you now have 4,000 people. At, well, at the end of five, you've got 1,000, but then another six months, you've doubled that. you got 2,000. At the end of six years, you've got 4,000. At the end of seven years, you've got 16,000 people, 16,384. At the end of eight years, 65,536. At the end of nine years, you now have 262,144 people. You now have over a quarter of a million people that you have led to Christ. And then in the next six months, you've doubled that. You've got 524. You now have half a million. At the end of the next six months, which would be a total of 10 years, you now have 1,048,000. 1,576 folks. But now you're trying to reach the whole world. And just this month, I believe it is just this month, the world's population reached 8 billion. And you say, man, I can't do much. Who am I? I'm just one person. This is what one person could do if he would train the people under him to keep doing this. And the next six months, you go from two, 1 million to 2 million. In the next six months, you'll have 4,194,304 people. In the next six months, you'll double it to 8 million. By the end of your 12th year, you have now reached 16,777,216. In 12 and a half years, you will have reached 33 million people. And another six months, you've now reached 67 million. By the end of the, that's the end of the 13th year. By the end of the 14th year, you've now, now my calculator wouldn't go any higher than 67,108,864. So now I've got to approximate it. So I had to put 134.2. So at the end of 14 years, you now have 268.4 million. At the end of 15 years, you now have 1 billion, 73.6 million. In the next six months, you've got 2 billion. At the end of 16 years, you now have 4 billion billion, 294.4 million people, and in six more months, if you keep doing that, you will have reached 8,588.8 million human beings. In other words, you, in, if you could do this for 16 and a half years, you'd reach more than the world's population is today. People say, but one person can't do much. That's God's man. That's God's man. But if you would be dedicated for 16 years, I mean, you yourself, for the next... 16 years. But see, I don't, know if, I don't know if we got that much time. If they start offering up daily sacrifices in the next 24 months, and they may very well do that. Next 12 months, I mean. In the next 12 months, they could do that. And then that means we are three and a half years away from the Great Tribulation. So whatever you and I are going to do. Now, I'll, let, me, let, me, let me digress. Maybe they'll find at least one little white hair on each of those, those red heifers. If that's so, then they can't offer up the sacrifices. But they're saying now, out of all those, those five heifers, they think at least one of them will be solidly red. Because right now, all five of them are solidly red. If at least one of them still is, 12 or less than 12 months, about 10 months from now, they're going to offer it up, take the ashes of the red heifer, 
purify the priesthood, purify the altar, and brother, we're on the countdown to the coming of Jesus. That may be how close we are. Now, if God doesn't want it to happen for another 50 years, those red heifers, there'll be little white hairs on them. Okay, so now we don't know. It might be another 10, 15, 20, 30 years. We just don't know. But what if they do start doing that next year? We're on the countdown. Are you ready for the tribulation to come? I've been watching the news. They're talking about this Green New Deal is causing farmers to go out of business, not just in our country, but in other countries as well. One country that said that, that one third of the farms had closed up because they couldn't get diesel fuel and all that because of this climate mess that they're trying to do. So people are going to be going hungry here very, very soon. And in the great tribulation, there's going to be famine worldwide. And folks, a lot of that's caused by us. It's not that God is punishing us. What does it say in the book of Hosea? Thou hast destroyed thyself. We're doing it to our own selves. Now, I'm going to look at a verse in all the four Gospels here. And, and you may just want to listen. I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. You may want to write it down if you're taking notes and look it up later, perhaps. In Mark 16, 15, Jesus gave them the Great Commission. Go you into all the world, preach the Gospel. But he doesn't tell us here what the gospel is. In Matthew 24, verse 14, they'd ask him in verse 3, give us a sign of your coming. And Jesus talked about all the things that were going to happen. He said, but the end is not yet. However, when this gospel, verse 14, of the kingdom, Matthew 24, verse 14, when this gospel of the kingdom is preached in all the world, then the end comes. When? When you see the abomination of desolation, verse 15 says. And so he gives us a little more information about what the gospel is. Now, I am going to turn to Luke, the last chapter. Luke gives us a little more information about the gospel. Now, remember, the Great Commission is going to all the world, and we've got to preach a message he calls the gospel. In, Matt, in Luke 24, verse 46, Thus it is written, that Thus it behooved Christ to suffer and rise the third day. Now, <clears throat> in fact, <clears throat> in my reference Bible above verse 46, <clears throat> it says the commission... Here's the commission, verse 47, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. But wait a minute, I thought the gospel was supposed to be preached in all nations. That is the gospel. Mark just says preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew says preach the gospel of the kingdom. Luke says in all nations you're to preach repentance and remission of sins. That is the gospel. Somebody will say, well, how's that the gospel of the kingdom? Because you cannot get into the kingdom until you have repented and have your sins remitted. Now, well, I, I, I forgot to read something else in Matthew here. Let me run back to Matthew here real quick. In Matthew 28, the King James is highly accurate, but they did make a mistake here in the Great Commission. Here's what it says in Matthew 28, 19. Go, therefore, and teach all nations. That's a mistranslation. The Greek says, make disciples. Don't teach all nations, but make disciples from among all nations, baptizing them in, the Greek word aes, it means into, the name. What is the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? The name, the one name all share is the name God. You're baptizing them into the name of God, and you baptize them in his name, meaning by Jesus' authority. Teaching them to observe all things, whatever I've commanded you. So now we're getting a little more information about the Great Commission. Go preach the gospel, tell them about repentance and remission of sins, and then make disciples from those people and baptize them. All of that is the Great Commission. Any questions? Now in the Gospel of John, John chapter 20. John is not a synoptic gospel. He writes a little differently than the rest of them. In John chapter 20 and verse 23, Jesus said, you see this in red layers, whosoever sins you remit, it has to be remission of sins, we just read that in Luke 24, they'll be remitted, and if you retain them, they'll be retained. Very few people I've turned down for baptism, but if they haven't repented, I don't baptize them. Now what did, Paul, what did Peter say? Be baptized for the remission. That's how you get your sins remitted. And it says, not, not that the water does it, but you're making an outward confession of your faith in Christ. And when you get baptized, it's like <clears throat> someone getting married. 
when they put the ring on the finger, they have now said, okay, yes, I agree to it. I am agreeing to follow Christ my whole life, and now you can have your sins remitted. Then in John 21, verse 15, the last line, Jesus said, feed my lambs. Verse 16, the last line, feed my sheep. Verse 17, the last line, feed my sheep. All of that is part of the Great Commission. Go make disciples, teach them, and then God's minister's job is to feed the sheep. Why does he call them sheep? In John 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. So he likens us to a sheep who follow their shepherd without question. That's how we're supposed to be. Are there any questions? Colossians chapter 1, I'm going to read this to you. It's just one verse. Here's what it says. For by him, Jesus, were all things created. You read that in John 1, 3. That are in heaven or on earth, visible and invisible thrones, it doesn't matter. All things were created by him, and listen to this, and for him. All things were made for Jesus. It's to take the message of Jesus to the whole world. Back when was it? The late 1800s, perhaps? Early 1900s? Marconi invented the wireless. And he was able to communicate with no wires. He had some friends go across a hill, and he was able to communicate to them with a, a Morse code through a hill, no wires. Within a year, they were communicating across the Atlantic Ocean to England. God didn't allow Marconi to invent that just to send Morse code from one ship to another. It was a way to prepare to take the gospel to the world. They said in Matthew 24, 3, give us a sign when the end of the age will come and you're coming. He said, this gospel will go into all the world and then the end comes. How close are we to that scripture being fulfilled where the gospel is going into all the world? Think about it. Marconi just started mass communication. Then there was radio. Then there was TV. Then there became satellite television. And now we have the internet. All of us for him. YouTube was invented to spread the gospel. Now, they may not tell you that. But the Bible tells you that. It was invented to spread the gospel. And I want to announce today that we plan to start a new YouTube channel where we can extend our outreach to many thousands of people around the world. I don't know how much it's going to cost. The cost, the initial startup cost to bring traffic to the website, I don't know. I know we have one gentleman up in Canada, he may be watching today, I hope he is, who actually spent some of his own money to bring traffic to our channel here for our weekly service. I remember there was one Saturday, uh, he determined, he, he found out there were 1,500 people in Pakistan watching our service. But he had to spend money to bring that traffic to, that, to this channel. Now he's not doing that, I don't think, right now. But imagine that. So we should commit and I'm asking all of you to, to commit with me for just one year, just one full year, to reach many thousands more with the truth of God. And then next year we'll know whether or not one of those red heifers are going to be sacrificed. Wouldn't it be something if they do do that and the next year you just waste time when you could be working for Christ? This could be our last year, folks. You know, with the people we now have in government, uh, there's been talk about taking away tax exempt status from the churches. That's going to hurt us a great deal. People give money to preach the gospel, and then 20% or 30% or whatever that goes to, to Uncle Sam to pay Planned Parenthood to kill babies. It's an abomination. But that may happen. The devil hates Christians, and the devil hates the gospel, and the devil's going to try to stop it. And I'm telling you, if we are this close to the time of the end, we'll know a year from today or earlier we're going to know then what will you be doing before that happens now there again the tribulation won't start next year if they offer up the red heifer but it will in three and a half years there's going to be a three and a half year period when they're going to offer up sacrifices we need to start now doing all we can you might call it the final push do everything we can to reach the world not just Cabarrus County, but the
the world. You say, well, you're reaching people through this every, every week. Yeah, but it's a very tiny, very, very tiny amount. Yesterday, I checked our views for our weekly service here. Last week, we had a total of 62 views on YouTube. On YouTube. That's not real bad. For us, we got more people actually watching us on YouTube than are here today. November the 5th, we had 57 views. October the 29th, we had 62 views. You see, kind of averages out around 60. October the 22nd, now we had 65 views on that one. The title of that was, Can Christians Miss the First Resurrection? But again, only 65 views. October the 8th, we had 40 views. October the 1st, we had 59 views. Do you see what I'm saying? We're not reaching hundreds. We're certainly not reaching thousands. On September 17th, and these were the highest numbers. That's why I picked these dates, 67 views. And that was because we had a message called Beware the Cults. People wanted to find out about that, 67 people. August 27th, we had 57 views, and that was for a, a message entitled God's Master Plan for Humanity, but only 50-some people cared to learn about that. Now, we did have a large one. Uh, July the 9th, the title of the message was Things to Do Before the Tribulation. 91 people watched that. But again, we need to be reaching a lot more than 90-some people. And that's why we're going to start this new program as soon as we can learn the mechanics. I'm ready to start the thing, but it's just a matter of, of uh, uh, Dr. Eberhardt's going to help me. She's a computer genius. <laughs> and uh, maybe Steve and maybe Randy will. We'll have some, maybe some of you can help too. We're going to get this thing off and running. On, uh, on June 18th, we had 90 views. And believe it or not, we actually finally did break 100 on June 4th. We had 112 views that day, and the title of that was Five Steps to Having Great Faith. People are still very much interested in how to have great faith, because, you know, everybody's going to need it one day when they get sick. Now, if you average just those dates, it comes out to 70-some views. Maybe that's not bad, but we need to be doing so much more. It's interesting, the big pullers on YouTube, they get a lot more than 60 or 70 people. Here's one that, that was only 12 and a half minutes long. It just came out November the 16th, this month. They already have 432,000 views. And the title of it is, <laughs> Why Men Age Like Fine Wine. Almost half a million views. People want to know that. We don't need great things just when we get sick, we that's, need great faith to live day by day. And a lot of that's why we had broke over a hundred on that week, yeah. Because people want to know. Here's one that came out two weeks ago. The discovery of ancient Hebrew scrolls attributed to Moses. That had three hundred and twenty eight thousand views. Again, we get less than a hundred every week. Um no, wait a minute. It that one got seventy thousand views. The three hundred and twenty eight thousand views that one was for the reason why men are walking away from dating. These are just things that popped up on my, on my YouTube. I turned it on. There it was. I didn't go look for them. Here's one. Must see evidence about the temple location. That came out the 18th of November. 92,000 views. What's wrong with us? We need to be doing more. They're marketing. Yeah, they're knowing how to market these things, and that's what we've got to learn to do. And I'm only asking you to get behind this for one year, really help us to reach tens of thousands of people out there in the world who need Jesus. Four days ago, something came out called the Scar Stargate Anomaly. It, just in the last four days, already has 70,000 views. I plan to do a series, and I talked to a Christopher about this last week, because uh, his company, they are doing something, and they, they decided that the attention span of most people were two minutes. I was going to do five minutes. And so I've decided to follow that uh, thought and do a two-minute video to start with. It may go from two minutes to three minutes as people continue to listen. But we're going to start with two-minute videos on this new YouTube channel. And I want to start doing that like every day if I can. Just do it every day once we get started and just see how many people we can reach. And, it, yeah, it's going to take marketing. And I don't know how much money that's going to take. I really don't know. I found out, though, as I was looking at, at a whole bunch of these yesterday, and I spent hours looking at this, a lot of people are interested in what happens when you die. I saw one 
some kind of a program called Closer to Truth. And this guy was walking through a cemetery and he was saying, what really does happen when people die? And I looked at that guy and I said, that looks like Bob Kuhn. Well, I haven't met Bob Kuhn, but I heard him when I went to the ministerial conference many years ago when I was a senior in college. And he got his PhD in brain science at age 23, I think. Brilliant man. And he's doing this series, and he's got, I don't know how many, thousands and thousands and thousands of views. People are very interested. And so that's what I plan to do. I'm not going to get into a doctrinal thing like the three days and three nights or anything like that. I'm going to talk about something that's, that's not only interesting to Christian folks and church-going people, but everybody, atheists, are interested in what happens when you die. Yes, sir? That's because we already know what happens when we live. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. We just want to know what happens when we die. Yeah. And there's a giant interest in that. I've clicked on one of those. What's that? I've, I've clicked on one of those videos. Oh, okay. About what happens when you die. Several of them, actually. Let's see what else. I didn't have time to look at these. I just looked at the titles and, and uh, tried to see how many see views they had. Yeah. Here's one called Eternal Oblivion Theory Unveiled. That came out a year ago. It's already got 106,000 views. And this was put out by people that don't believe there's an afterlife. Here's another one. What happens when we die? According to the Bible, that one got 1.3 million views. That came out two years ago. But still, that's over 54,000 a month. And we get less than 200 a month. You see what I'm saying? Not 200,000, just 200. Here's another one. I saw my mom in hell. Now, I'll get people to watch they had, a, had over 400,000 views. Here's one. Scientists discover what really happens after death. That came out seven months ago. It's already got over half a million views, 690,000. Here's one just, just entitled Afterlife. Came out seven months ago. One million views. That's over 142,000 people clicking into that per month. Here's one. Clinically dead man comes back after death. One month ago, it already has 772,000 views in one month. Here's one, what Jesus said about life, life after death. It came out two years ago, it has two million views. That's over 100,000 a month. Here's one called pronounced dead for 20 minutes. Two years ago, it has 4.3 million views. And it was a less than a 20 minute video. Here's one, what happens at the time of death? That came out one year ago, it also has 4.3 million views. That's 358,000 monthly views, if you average it out. So people are very interested in this particular topic. So how can we reach tens of thousands of people? Let me give you just a handful more. I want to show you that people are very interested in this topic. Just give me about, I want to do about six or seven more here real quick. One called Last Moment of Life came out a year ago. It already has 1.7 million views. Here's one women on crossing over, that means dying, 5.9 million views. You know, our YouTube videos go back to the, to the year 2016. And if you add all of the views up together, and some of those are the same people, we don't have that, that kind. Make one that says... We have discovered what happens. When yeah. Die. Yeah, something like that. We have discovered it. Is there life after death with Bill Nye? Now, he's an atheist, and some other atheists, that came out a year ago, and it's already, these are atheists, it's already got 1.7 million views. Then here's one What really happens when you die came out four years ago, has 3.7 million views. Here's one. Now, listen to this one. The title is I Died. Women share their new. Death account, and they already have six million views. That's what we need. There was one, I'll mention only one more. This one came out three days ago on the 23rd of November, and it already has 880 million, some 880 million, 880,000. In three days, it already has 880,000 and some. But I can't compete with it because it was three girls in bikinis. So we'll forget that. Some things I can't do. Are there any questions? Now, all I'm asking us to do is to commit just for one year. 
starting now. Don't wait till January. Start now and commit till till December next year. Yes. All right, I'm going to explain. There are three okay. things. <coughs> there are three things I want us to commit to. Number one, believing prayer. Mark 11, 24. Whatever you desire, I want to reach a million and some folks in the next year. We can do it. They're doing it. These people talking about what happens when you die, they're doing it. Why shouldn't we do it? Jesus said, go into all the world. Now, the first scripture I gave you was when Paul went out and turned the world upside down. He was just one man, and Silas was with him. All right, so number one, believing prayer. Pray, and I want us all to pray that God will help us to reach the right people. You say, but I, I don't know how to preach to people. I'm not saying go out and preach per se. But, you know, there was a man down here, a waiter down at IHOP some years ago, and I talked to him and talked to him and talked to him. Here's one of the ways you witness to people. You, you ever thought about going to Bible college? He said, well, I thought about it. Okay, well, and I began to talk to him, gave him a card, and I thought for sure he was going to come. Well, he didn't come. But then there was another fellow. I just walked into his front yard, and I said, Bible college is starting here in two weeks. Why don't you come? He said, I think I will. And he did. He liked orientation so much he stayed through the whole first year, came back the next year. He had two degrees, came back, got his master's, came back, and got his doctorate. And all I had to do was walk into his front yard, and I hardly knew him, and said, why don't you come to Bible college? Sometimes all you have to do is ask. I knew a girl in college. She was one of the most popular girls in the entire school, beautiful girl from England, and and there was only two guys dating her, me and one other fellow from Georgia. And we knew that one of us was going to marry her. And uh, she was gorgeous. I sent a picture of her home to my dad. My dad told me I better hurry up with that. But I'm a little slow. And so the other guy finally came to me and he said, well, said, I've got a girl back home. Before I decide to marry this one, I better go home and make sure I'm, I'm done with the one at home. So he went back home. He found out he still loved the girl back home. He came back and said, guess what, Keith? You get to have her. You can marry her. I'm not going to marry her. I'm going to marry the girl back home. And he did. And went back home and married the girl back home. So I thought, well, I have no competition now. Before I could even get the next date with her, Somebody said, hey, did you hear that so-and-so is engaged to be married? I said, no, she's not. Because so-and-so, I won't mention his name. Who knows? He might be listening. So-and-so told me that, that, that he was going to let me have her. They said, no, she's engaged. To who? They told me the name of somebody I've never heard of before. And I went to her and I said, is this true what I've heard? She said, yes. I said, but you've been dating me and so-and-so. <laughs> she was dating us both, figuring out which one she likes best. She said, uh, yeah, I'm engaged to him. I said, well, how did that happen? She said, well, I don't actually know him. I said, well, then why did you accept his, in, his proposal? She said, he asked. That's all, he asked. Sometimes all you got to do is say, will you? And they'll say, mm, yeah, I will. Sometimes we don't make the sale because we don't ask for the sale. When I, I've been in quite a number of uh, businesses where I was in sales. And one of the things they tell you to do is to assume the sale. Don't ask them, do you want to buy this? Say, uh, how do you want to How do you want to buy this? You want to charge it? You want to pay cash? You don't say, do you want to, but how do you want to pay for it? See, you assume the sale. Now, that's marketing. That's what they teach you in marketing. If I had asked her to marry me, she would have said, yes, we'd be happily married to this day. But this other guy moved in right in between me and that fellow. That was there. I don't know how he did that, but he did it. Sometimes we just need to approach people. They, come, they think, oh, uh, here's what we think. Well, they won't listen to me. You don't know. I knew a fellow that I thought that he was so hard-hearted spiritually that you'd never be able to reach him. And I found out I was very badly wrong. He came around. And so what we need to do is have believing prayer. That's number one. Now, number two and number three have to do with witnessing. Number two deals with personal witnessing. People say, I don't know how to do that. In John chapter 4, Jesus had preached to multitudes of people. Multitudes. And yet he took the time to sit down with one lady and a Gentile in Samaria. He said, if you had known who it was that speaks to you, 
Talking about himself. You would have asked of him and he would have given you living water. She said, that sounds pretty good to me. Give it to me. He said, go call your husband. And what was he doing? He was witnessing to her and shared with him. She said, I know when the Messiah comes, he'll tell us all things. Jesus said, I mean, he just outright told her, I'm the Messiah. And she went and told her friends. And a whole bunch of people started believing on Jesus. And now, this lady didn't have the college education that you have. She didn't have, she may have been illiterate. We don't know. She didn't have a great, very important job. She just went out and was pulling water. And yet she won how many people we don't know to Christ? Do personal witnessing. Now, if you say, well, I don't know how to do that. Tell them that you are a graduate of a Bible college and we're accepting applications. Say, so have you ever thought about going to Bible college? Where do you go to church, by the way? And you start getting in a chit-chat conversation. I've, I've run into people at the grocery store. Give them my business card. You just never know who might, that God may already be softening up their heart so that when they meet you at the grocery store, they're ready. Or wherever you may meet them, at the gym or wherever it might be. So number two is personal witnessing. Number three, corporate witnessing. That's where we as a team can do so much more together. You know, somebody said you can break a string, you put two of them together, it makes it, makes it really strong. You put three of them, you weave three of them together, and it's almost impossible to break. That's also in the book of Ecclesiastes. So together as a corporate body, we can, through, uh, it's going to take a lot of money. I don't know how much it's going to take, but through, if we just obey God's law of tithing and giving, we are going to be able to support this new outreach, and I'm very, very excited about doing it. And it's going to take more than just a few one-time offerings. It's going to take consistent monthly support to be able to do this. And I've never passed a plate, and I'm not doing it today, but I'm just saying just do what God told you to do. God commands us to tithe, and so you need to do that. Continual prayer, not just a one-time prayer, but continual prayer. Lord, bless this outreach. Let us reach hundreds of thousands. Folks, it can be done. Hundreds of thousands. If they can do it, they're talking about life after death, so can we. And we're going to, with your help, with your prayers. Now, can we do it in 16 years? Will we be able to reach the whole world? Well, I don't know if we're going to be able to reach the whole world in 16 years because people won't keep doing it every six months, but you could potentially do that. You know, uh, I had a very dear friend down in East Texas, and he was always struggling financially. I'd say, hey, let's go get a cup of coffee. And he'd take his pockets and pull them out and show me he didn't even have any pennies in his pocket. And I'd have to buy his coffee. One time we went to see a movie that I wanted to go see, and he couldn't pay for the movie. I had to pay for his ticket. I mean... And it was a beautiful movie. And I'm sitting there at the end of that movie thinking, I can't believe I took him to go see this movie. It was a very nice romantic movie. It ended up being my favorite movie of all time. I took him to go see it. <laughs> <clears throat> because he couldn't afford it. So I talked to him one time. I said, you know, uh, I need to sit down with you and work out a budget because, you know, you're here you are, you're going hungry, and you're making more money than I am. Let's look, work, work out a budget. Now, how much money do you make per week, per month, whatever? And I wrote it down, all right? And let's say take 10% for tithes and 20% for taxes. That leaves you. He said, wait a minute, I'm not paying tithes. I said, why not? He said, because I can't afford it. And I said, oh, no, here's part of the problem. We don't tithe to turn loose of our money. Dear me, we don't want to turn loose of money. That's stupid. We honor God. It's an act of worship. And if we will do that, and worship God and honor God, God's going to take care of us. Well, he started, let me tell you what happened. I told him, I said, if you would just uh, start tithing, the Bible promises that God will bless the tither. And so he did consistently. I know he did for a fact. Because I took, he would give me the money because I was working for the church down there in East Texas. And I turned that money in every week. So I knew how much he was tithing. Six months he quit. I said, why are you quitting? God didn't bless me. He tried it for six months, and I really think that he had the idea, I'll do it for six months if it doesn't work. Folks, I'm going to tell you now, it doesn't work. What you are supposed to do is to honor God, whether it works for you or not. You honor God. That's what it's all about. Now, I had a professor in college. When he was a student in college, and he was dating this girl that he wanted to marry, 
he said, uh, she let him know that she'd marry him. And he said, well, there's something you need to know. I believe in tithing. And whoever I marry is going to have to be on the same page with me. You're going to have to believe in tithing. She said, okay. He said, no, no, you need to understand. I don't mean just, you know, if it's convenient. Even if we don't have enough money to eat, we're going to pay our tithes. Do you understand that? Are you in agreement? She said, okay. He said, I want you to really understand now. He said, we may have to chop up our furniture and use it for firewood because we can't afford heating oil. But we're going to honor God with our tithes. And she said, okay. And they got married. And they stayed married. And he said to our class, he was a professor that I had in college, he said, I've never had to bust up our furniture. We don't miss our meals. God has taken care of us. Because he wasn't doing it to get something from God. He was doing it to honor God. And my friend that I told you about was just hoping that God would prosper him. But he wasn't doing it to honor God. What is your motive? People say, I've tried that tithing. It doesn't work. What do you mean it doesn't work? You mean you didn't honor God? Well, what's wrong with you then? You know why it didn't work? Because they didn't have the mindset that it was God's to begin with. The tithe belongs to God, yeah. I mean, everything belongs to God. Yeah. In fact, let me, uh, you gave me a, an idea. Here's a scripture I want to read you. Chapter 22 of Leviticus. I think it's just one verse here. But I'm going to go back and read something from Samuel too. Leviticus 22, 32. It says, I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord who hallows you. You hallow me, and I'm going to hallow or make holy you. That's what hallow means, to make holy. Now, in 2 Samuel, in chapter 2, remember, Saul didn't do what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to honor God, and he didn't do it. Tithing is one act of honoring God. In 2 Samuel chapter 2, I think I meant 1 Samuel. Excuse me. Well, the year is almost over. I guess I'm entitled to make one mistake before the year is up. Chapter 2 of 1 Samuel and verse 27, there came a man of God to Eli, he was the high priest, and said, Thus says the Lord, did I plainly appear to the house of your father, meaning Aaron, when they were in Egypt, in Pharaoh's house, and did not choose him out of all the tribes of Israel? In other words, I chose your ancestor, Eli. Verse 29, why? Wherefore, why then do you kick at my sacrifice and at my offering? So he wasn't using the sacrifices to honor God. And you honor your sons above me. Now, if you want to know what his sons were doing, read verses 21 and 22. But he said, you are honoring your sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of, my, of Israel, my people. You're, just, you're, you're not honoring me with these sacrifices. You're just getting fat yourself. You're just becoming prosperous yourself. Therefore, verse 30, the Lord God of Israel says, and this is the verse I want to come to, I said indeed that your house... And the house of your father should walk before me forever, but now the Lord says, be it far from me. For them that honor me, now think about yourself, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. If you honor God, he'll honor you. But here's what was happening with my friend. He wasn't doing it to honor God. I kind of made him feel guilty about it until he finally gave in and started doing it. And then he tried it for six months. He just thought he'd try it for six months. He lived in a two-story house, and he could hardly pay rent. And he had hundreds and hundreds of books. And I said, listen, I got an idea. Get rid of this house. Move into a small apartment like I live in. He said, where am I going to put all my books? I said, sell them or give them away. But move into a little, tiny, small apartment. You won't have all this rent you got to pay and then you'll be able to pay your tithes well he put his books ahead of God he put his treasures ahead of his honor for God and of course God didn't honor him God didn't bless him God didn't heal him when he needed healing he died a few years ago at age 44 more than 10 years ago now that's too young to die but he put his things there's more to it than just tithing yeah. I mean, he, he wasn't tithing correct. He probably wasn't keeping the Sabbath. I wasn't doing a lot of things that God tells us to do. 
Yeah. Uh, if you're partial and allow balance, that is huge. Yeah. I know he was going to church every Sabbath because, in fact, I helped to baptize him. But yet, he, he just, he finally found a church where he could still keep the commandments and yet not tithe because they didn't teach tithing and he was happy there. He was in that church till he died. And the guy that was running that church was always in financial straits all the time. <laughs> Second Chronicles 31. You might ask me, well, when are you going to get this started? As soon as we can figure out how to do it and how to advertise. I may want to talk to our gentleman up there in Canada who had driven so much traffic to our site uh, in, in a few years ago. I want to find out how to do this because I want to get this started right away. This month, well, this month is almost over, but, but certainly in a week or so, as soon as we can get it going. In Second Chronicles 31, in verse 4, Moreover, he, the, the king, commanded the people that dwelt in Jerusalem to give the portion of the priests and the tithes, that they might be encouraged in the law of the Lord. The portion was, of course, the tithe. And as soon as the commandment came abroad, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of the corn, wine, and oil, honey, and of all the increase of the field, and the tithe of all things brought they in abundantly. Verse 6, And concerning the children of Israel and Judah that dwelt in the cities of Judah, they also brought in the tithe of the oxen and the sheep, <clears throat> and the tithe of holy things. They were consecrated to the Lord their God, and they laid them by heaps. In the third month they began to lay the foundation of the heaps, and finished them in the seventh month. I mean, they brought in all these tithes that they hadn't been paying before. And it now, so they went back and thought about how much do I owe God, apparently. This is how much I'm behind, I guess. And they, they brought all these tithes and offerings in heaps to the temple where, where they were being fed spiritually. In verse 10, it says, We have plenty to eat and have left plenty. The Lord has blessed his people, and that which is left is this great store. They still had more. And so that's, if the people had been doing that all along, they would have been okay. Now, in chapter 30, in verse 1, Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters to Ephraim and Manasseh, and they, that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover to the Lord their God. And they decided, they were trying to get, because people had gotten away from obeying God, and they were trying to get them all to do that. Verse 6, so the post, you know, a post office means a letter office, the post were the letters, and the post or the postmen who took those letters went with the letters from, with the, from the king and his princes throughout all Israel and Judah. And they said, you children of Israel, turn again to the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Israel, and he will return to the remnant of you. You who are escaped, God will come back to you and he will, he will bless you. And then in verse 8, now don't be stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves to the Lord and enter into his sanctuary which he sanctified forever. Serve the Lord your God that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. Folks, when the great tribulation comes and it could start in the next few years, I don't want, I don't want to have to go through that. That's not God's wrath, that's Satan's wrath, but Satan's going to try to kill all of us. For if you turn again to the Lord, your brother and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive. So even if you and I go into captivity, God's going to take care of us. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if he will not turn away his face from you if you do something, if you return to him. Now, what was their response? Verse 10, so the post passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even into Zebulun, but they laughed them to scorn and mocked them so they wouldn't come up and keep Passover. Oh, that was ancient. That's back in Moses' day. This is the modern day. We're, we're in the modern uh, 8th century B.C. So we don't need to do that anymore. Okay, I'll take it just a moment. Nevertheless, diverse certain ones of Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. What's the question? Um, when they were in the captivity, did they give? Did they give? I'm assuming. <clears throat> Uh, well, tithing is not giving. Tithing is paying. But I know. I think I know what the person means. When they were in captivity, whatever they would have earned as as uh, slaves and whatever they would consider to be their own, they'd be required to tithe it and to give if they had it, if they were able to. We're not. We're not given that information in the Bible. 
Now, in Malachi 3, and this is something, I'm very, the biggest criticism I've had over the years in my ministry is you don't tell people enough about giving so that God can bless them. But we know what the Bible says about tithing and giving. We already know that. In Malachi 3, in verse 7, it says, Even from the days of your fathers, you're gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I'll return to you. One of the ways we return to God is we, we, we honor him. Now listen, what you if you help us financially by just obeying God, paying your tithes here, if you will do that, we can reach tens of thousands of new people with the truth of God. And if one of those people gets saved and come into the first resurrection who would not have otherwise, you're a part of that. You know, God doesn't need our help at all. We're not helping God. But we read in the last, I think it's the last verse of 1 Corinthians 15, we should always be abounding in the work of the Lord. What is his work? It's getting the gospel out so people can be saved. And we can be a part of God's work because he chooses to partner with us. Because he's a loving father. He chooses to partner with us. God said, return to me and I'll return to you. But you said, where are you and how shall we return? Here's his answer. Will a man rob God, but you've robbed me? They say, where are you and we robbed you? He said, tithes and offerings. He said, bring, verse 10, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat or food in my house. And prove me if I won't open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. There won't be room enough to receive it. And here's what I'll do. I'll rebuke the devourer for your sakes. Is there a disease trying to devour your health? Remember Acts 10, the Bible says, Jesus healed all that were oppressed of the devil. Sometimes the devil can be the devourer, the oppressor, and God will rebuke him for you. And all, verse 12, will call you blessed. We need to keep that in mind. You know, when you're a, you were a little boy or a little girl and you would go and help your dad or your mom, uh, sometimes it actually slowed your father down. And as a little boy, you'd say, Daddy, can I help you? He's working on the car or whatever. And so the father knew he could get, do it a lot faster if you'd go inside and watch TV. But he'd say, okay, go get me a wrench, go get me a screwdriver. And sometimes it was actually worse, but a loving father will partner with his little boy and teach his little boy how to use a pair of pliers, how to use a screwdriver. He'll teach his son those things. I used to go out and help my dad try to help. I don't think I was actually helping too much when he was working on the car. And you ladies, you know, when your mother was cooking in the kitchen, you'd run in there and, can I help you cook? Well, probably you couldn't help. But she, as a loving mother, would say, okay, get the butter, get this, get that, get this out of the shelf, get that out of the shelf. And so she, it's not that she needed your help, but she allowed you to help her to do what she was doing. God doesn't need us to help him, but he will honor us and partner with us and allow us to be a part of his work. His work is getting people saved. You can't save anybody. But you can be involved in God's work. Believing prayer, personal witnessing, and then corporate witnessing with us as a church. And then finally, and I'll conclude with Galatians 6. So many people have told me, well, I've tried that type of stuff. It doesn't work. What do you mean it doesn't work? You mean you didn't honor God? Oh, yeah, I honored God, but, you know, God didn't honor me. God didn't bless me. Well, sometimes we're not doing it correctly. By the way, uh, one of the things that prompted this message, not only was my desire to, to, to get to start this YouTube channel, but every January we send out tax-deductible receipts. And so you can, the money that you would normally pay Uncle Sam, and a lot of that goes to our Air Force, and that's good, but some of it goes to Planned Parenthood to kill babies, and you're paying for it. And who, who knows how, all the, the stuff that a lot of your taxes are going for that you don't agree with as a Christian. But you can deduct that money from Uncle Sam and put it into the work of the gospel. Because we are a 501c3 nonprofit, so they yeah. are tax deductible. It, so your, money, your, yeah, your, your, your donations are 100% tax deductible. For those of you watching in other countries, it doesn't work. But for those in the contiguous, not just the continuous, but the entire United States of America, uh, if you're in any of the 50 states and you make a donation to this ministry, you can deduct it from your income tax 
uh, come this January or, wh or whenever you're taking your, doing your taxes. So a lot of a lot of churches I know all of a sudden in December they get all these big gifts in trying to get it in before the 31st uh, of December. Galatians 6 4 says, let every man prove his own work, put it to the test. Are you doing what God wants you to do? And then he'll have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Verse 6, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto. Look in the margin of your King James Bible. You, do you see what it says? It says share with him. In Old English, communicate meant to share. Let him that is taught in the word share with him that teaches in all good things. And I was out on my prayer path some years ago, and I was meditating on this, and I didn't hear a voice from God, but this thought came to me just as plain. Isn't tithing a good thing? I thought, yeah. So share with him in tithing. Be not deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap, but you're going to have to do it to honor God. For he that sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But if you're sowing to the Spirit, to the leading of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is leading us to take the gospel to the world if you sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap life everlasting, not just for yourself, but think about all the people we can reach for Jesus Christ. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. God is going to bless us. And as we have opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially them of the household of faith. So, one man told me a few years ago, he said, I pay all my tithes to the international embassy of, of Christians and Jews. He told me that over and over. I, that's where I sent all my tithes to. I said, well, that's fine. If you want to do that. But it was me who visited him at the hospital multiple times when he was sick. And, and uh, it was always me who was at the hospital. The people from the international embassy of Jews and Christians never came to visit him. So, you know, where you're being fed, where you're being ministered to, and yes, if you're being ministered to and being fed by different groups, they are eligible for the tithe. But if you want to help us to reach the world, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and maybe in the next year, over a million people or more, pray for this work, for this new thrust. Do your own personal witnessing. Maybe you'll end up turning this county upside down. Maybe you'll do that. And number three, corporate witnessing. Help us to go out and reach many, many more people. We can do this. With God, all things are possible. Are there any questions? Um, any other questions online? There was a scripture in John 21, 16 and 17. Feed my sheep. Mm -hmm. That's what it says. Feed my lambs, feed my sheep. What, did somebody want to know about that? No, they just posted that yeah. scripture in the chat. And I'm doing my best to, to feed... Those of you who come here with the Word of God, not what Moody said or Luther said or Calvin or some of these Protestant reformers. I, I grew up hearing that all the time. I want to give you what God's Word says. And that's why, uh, by the way, if you've already got your degree, whether it's bachelor's or associate's or whatever, you're free to take repeat classes anytime and every time you want to for free for the rest of your life. And come back and keep getting the Word. Keep getting the Word. Keep, we've got one person doing that this year taking the associate's class. And she's coming back here week after week after week to get more and more into it. Well, uh, I tell you what, let's do. Let's end this service with a prayer. And I'm going to ask you to be in agreement with me. Yes, ma'am. Before you pray, um, I, have a, I don't have a question, actually. I want to share something, though. I um, was prepared. I had an offering today, right? I just want you guys to know what happened. So this may be for somebody in all different ways. Mm -hmm. um, this week, I lost two valuable things. Um, and this morning, I was, I stopped in to get some cash, okay, because I don't have a checkbook or anything, so I stopped to get some cash. And I went into a store, and the lady said, is this your money? She had it, money in her hand. And she said, is this your money? And I was like, no, it's not my money. You know, it wasn't, I didn't think it was my money. But when I got out there in the parking lot, I realized, what happened to that money? So I did, like, said it was my money. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> So, um, but the blessing of it is that God, they got it for me, and I called them, and I told them it was my money. I explained how many bills it was, the receipts, oh, and yeah, wow. so they said, no, I said, because you did ask me, was it mine, and I yeah. said, no. And um, so I, I hear the message and what God was telling me in that, 
but also on Tuesday, I was um, picking up my grandbaby. I took off my wedding rings. Why did I take off my wedding rings? People ask this question all the time. It's because I put a lot of, I still wash my hands a lot. I still put a lot of hand sanitizer on my hands. And even though my rings are real, it dulls it. The alcohol, yeah. Yeah. and I know this because my jeweler told me because he dips it once every 15 months. He dips mm-hmm. it. So they are real. <laughs> and, um, but the rings fell out in somebody's driveway. Oh, dear. Yeah. And so, but I knew who driveway it was, so I called them and they were at work and I asked them, I begged them to go home immediately to get to see if they see my rings because my rings are very valuable and they're very valuable to me. And yeah. so um, they got there within, I think, five minutes, and they found the ring. Oh, they found the rings. So, yeah, Good. so yeah. this week, listen, I lost the rings. They were found. I lost the money. They were found. But the thing, this is the blessing, because I didn't know where your message was going today. When I called the lady, the manager at the place I was at, they lost the money. I said, that money was going into church today. She said, church? She said, today? And I said, Sabbath service. She said, wait. So I'm going to go back and tell her where I've been this morning. Yeah. There might be a door open. You never know. know. So to I, I, did, I didn't even expect this message, but I just thought that that would intertwine into what you were mm-hmm. saying. Yeah. And uh, I want to be the first to say I will gladly help the ministry financially above tithes and offering to get where we need to be, to Thank get you. the word out. I would like to interject that the door is already Amen. open. Yeah, the door is open. And, uh, and we're going to know one year from now whether or not they're going to start offering up sacrifices. So let's not wait till then. Say, well, you know, if that happens, then I'll honor God. Let's honor God right now. Let's honor him today. Let's start now. And then, who knows, they may be doing that next year, and we'll already be ahead of the game. Don't wait till the last minute. Like my friend did, well, if God will bless me, you know, this kind of thing. Do you have questions on that? Um, no, I just wanted to say that if anybody wants to give, and they don't have a checking account or mm-hmm. they can give online. People can give online. Okay. Uh, ChristianFellowshipMinistries.org ChristianFellowshipMinistries.org and that money is going to go into our general fund so that we can reach I'd like to see us reach millions by the next year. And the, the program that I've got in mind literally can do it. It literally can. This is not just well, it probably won't happen. Yeah, it will. It's going to happen. Let's, so let's, let's end our service by praying together. You can stay seated. But let's pray together for this very thing, all right? And you can just please be in agreement with me. Mm-hmm. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, I ask you to bless this effort. I mean, we want to reach millions around the world with the truth of God. And we can start with this two-minute, uh, two- to three-minute little video about what happens when people die and God, I'm asking you now to, to hear our prayer. Jesus said, when we pray, believe we receive and we will have. So I'm asking you now to give us what we're asking for. Give us open doors to reach millions for Christ. Help us to, do, to, help, to be a part of your end time work of reaching many, many people with the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, lay it on the hearts of your true people around the world to begin supporting this outreach so that we can reach all these people that we need to reach. Bless us now. And God, for each person who is tithing and giving to this ministry, I'm asking you to give them a special financial blessing back. As they do it from their heart, bless them. In Jesus' name we pray, and we believe we receive. If you believe it, say amen. 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 We're dismissed. If y'all will remember my mama in prayer Thursday, she's having hip replacement and she's 75, so. And the doctor that's scheduled to do her surgery is not the original doctor that's her doctor. It's a new doctor. So, yeah.